I'm Tom Ray, and this is my art podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I get the chance to meet... My name's Nick, and I do vocals for American Bandit. I'm Ryan, and I'm the drummer. I'm Luke, I play bass. A really simple story. The, we had a guitarist in the band also named Nick, and he left, and then we were talking about a new band name, and he's a good friend of ours still, and he's like, American Bandit's a sick name, and we're like, that's a sick name. And he just had that one locked and loaded? He just had it locked right, and loaded yeah. and just like threw it out there. He's like, you guys can use it if you want. And we, it was better than anything we had come up with. So we were like, yeah, let's just roll with it. Okay. Why did he leave the band? Uh, he was getting married and joined the army and just was trying not to do the whole music thing. And then, so how long have you been together? You were playing before that. What was the band name? Uh, Audacity. Audacity. And then before that, it was Ending Eris. And right. so Ryan and I have been together since 2010. Luke just joined the band in 2019. You've always been in Milwaukee? I grew up in Illinois. So like Lake County, um, Gurney area. And then, really? I, yep, then I moved to the Milwaukee area in 2009. I met Ryan on the very first day of school okay. and went to band practice that same day. The same day? Literally the same, same day. day. I sat down in a class I didn't want to be in because I showed up to the high school late. Uh -huh. And I showed up to a class I didn't want, and I had the only place to sit down was next to Ryan. And we started talking music. He's like, I play in a band, band practice tonight. Do you want to come over? And I was like, I guess so, dude. And <laughs> that was it. At the time, me and our other guitarist, uh, who's still with us, Alec, were playing in a band with some other people at the time. This dude showed up to school, kind of hung out, and it just sort of it, it worked well. We had similar music taste. Here we are a decade later, still playing music together. How did you end up joining the lineup? I'm going to chime in and go back. About 10 years ago, actually, their old band, Ending Eris, they got my band, our first show back in the day. We were called Heresy. Now, I've known these guys for 10 years. Like, literally, like, we, we grew up hanging out together when we were, like, 16 all the way through now, playing shows and, you know, seeing each other at parties and just with... Mutual acquaintances. And before I started ARC with some friends, I knew of Ending Eris. And it was funny. I actually asked one of the members in the past if I could try out for the band. And they were like, you know what? We're actually looking for a keyboard player. And he was like, we practice here at this time. Why don't you come on out? We'll give you a tryout. So I didn't have a car. I didn't have a cell phone. I had like a $3,000 setup of like keyboard shit. I show up to the spot. My mom dropped me off. And all the lights are off. Mm -hmm. No one's home. It was not even the real address of where I was supposed to go. And my buddy came home like two hours later from grocery shopping with his mom. And he's like, hey, dude, what are you doing here? And I'm like, hey, man, like I'm here for band practice. Ending Ares practice is here, right? Yeah. And he's like, no, dude, they practice at Ryan's house. And I'm like, do you want to jam then? So I went inside. And then they picked this guy up for keyboards. So he originally played keyboards for them. And I was supposed to try out for them. But they ended up going with him because they all went to high school together. And here we are 10 years later, and now I just recently was like, hey, guys, you guys looking for a bass player? So it's kind of like a full circle thing. Like, it's real crazy how we all kind of ended up together here. 10 years of them finally giving you the right address, first of all. Can I just, what's with everybody having some sort of keyboard set up in this town? Like, right. so he had keyboard set up, but then you got to play the keyboard. So you were all hooked up with it, too, or what? I knew nothing about playing a keyboard. They just wanted to make room in the band for me. Okay. Sorry, Luke. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know a damn thing about it. Okay. And then that band broke up, and then we needed a vocalist. And I was like, thank fucking God. I don't need to pretend to play this keyboard anymore. <laughs> I just yell into this <laughs> microphone. Okay. And did you have any background in that, or it's like you that can yell real good? That was just also winging it, yeah. That, that's actually not very uncommon as oh, far as singing goes. I mean, the reason I started singing, I, I was in my first band in fourth grade, and the reason I did it is because I had a Mr. Microphone. It was a microphone that would hook up to the radio, and that was the extent of it. And then it just turned out that I could actually hold a note. But then later on, similar story, I was in a punk rock band, and I ended up playing drums because the guy that we knew had a mohawk. And they were like, well, he has to be the singer. I understand the circumstances. Right. Anyway, so what is the musical background of you guys? I mean, like I said, I don't play an instrument okay. at yeah, all. True. I just like music a lot. But I think when I moved to Milwaukee, like late 2009, early 2010, the metal scene there was just like very doing very very well so there was just yeah. like everybody knew everybody my like background with it all was you know picked up drums around the age of like 14 and um just sort of started playing with some friends and we put a metal band together and started playing some local shows and we realized there's this whole world of other people doing the same thing and it kind of just exploded from there because then you meet people from all these different places who are all doing the same thing and yeah we've just kind of fell in love with it and uh, there's there's no backing out now 
So what's weird about our area was a lot of it, a lot of people meeting each other didn't even really involve the music scene at the time until later on, but it was mainly orientated around being a mall rat when we were all younger. Okay. We would all go to the mall and there was just like groups of different people that would come in and out. And I know handfuls upon handfuls of people just from that who are now either going to shows constantly, used to go to shows constantly, playing in bands here and there. So it's like a big plethora of things where it's like just from being teenagers in the area, it kind of turned into like the, the baby steps of like seeing that there is a bigger thing here where, you know, you can go out and have a fun place to go and let your anger out. What is the musical taste or like uh, what what musical influences do you guys have? Like as far as American Bandit goes or just in general? Because I, I listen to everything from like 21 Pilots and Post Malone to like Knocked Loose and Every Time I Die. Hardcore all the way to like Billboard Top 40. I'm pretty much the same. If it's good, I like it. So at this point now I've come to appreciate most styles of music. Aside from the band, I run a studio in town and and am a producer for some bands in town and, and whatnot. So production value definitely influences my taste in music a lot. What's your studio setup like? I'm curious. Uh, it's a home studio in South Milwaukee. Basically, I moved into a house that had an unfinished basement and I finished it into a studio. That's my full-time gig. That's great. Yeah, I love it. That's been gone for about two years now, maybe full-time for the past year or so. So what would your musical influences be? When it boils down to the whole production side of things, too, I'm not necessarily a big stickler around it because in the last decade, I started picking up photography and I started traveling with like death metal and black metal bands. Really? So I, I, I hated it at first. I thought it was garbage and I, I couldn't get down with it. And then the first... Wait, why were you doing it if you hated it so much? Because I was able to tour. Oh, okay. I was able to just come along and leech onto successful bands and see the world with them. So, right. you know, I would just <laughs> pitch it to them, build a folder and like grew rapidly. And it gave me more opportunities than I thought were ever capable, honestly. And like after my first black metal tour that I, I think it was 17 days on the east coast i like really grew to like really really like that kind of music like death metal and black metal and yeah. that's i guess is my roots of it is just like hardcore death metal black metal i also get down with like post malone and pop stuff and catchy things like that too So you guys played Summerfest recently, right? Yeah. So how did you get hooked up in that, asking for a friend? Uh, <laughs> honestly, it's just networking, going to like a lot of radio events and meeting people. Really? Uh, I work with an artist management company and a record label in Milwaukee, N43 Records. Okay. So we're pretty close with like 88.9, so they were holding an event there. But yeah, we just met some great people at work at Summerfest there and sent them the music and... I was actually in Italy when I got the email saying... You were in Italy? Okay, yeah. Jesus Christ, man. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I was in Italy just, like, sitting in some pub with my girlfriend at the time, and um, who's still my girlfriend, just at the time we were sitting in the pub. And uh, I got the email that said that we were playing Summerfest, and I was just like, holy shit. Yeah. That was crazy. But it was a big moment, for sure. Right. So. And what were the other bands that you were playing with? Uh, we opened for Silent Planet, Silverstein, and August Burns Red. How did you start the job uh, working for this uh, artist management company? Um, I asked. <laughs> I literally just asked. Uh, a friend of mine was kind of working with the guy that works there, and he wasn't really into it, and I so he backed out, and I just showed up and was like, my friend is dumb for walking away from this, and okay. that was two years ago. And then what are some of the things you're doing to actually like promote yourself while you're setting up these shows? How do you uh, promote yourself while you're playing in other locations? Digital advertisement. You're actually doing the, see, oh, yeah. nobody ever does the digital advertising. I swear by it. Yeah, I know. I put money into digital marketing for pretty much every single show that we do. It's not like we have, we can't just drive to every city and put up flyers. And it makes a lot of sense to do it that way. I've seen decent results from it. Did you already have marketing knowledge? What kind of strategies are you using? Trial and error. Trial and error. Yeah. Okay. Use small budgets and mm -hmm. focus on a certain group of people. And if the $20 you spent didn't do very well, or you didn't get a lot of clicks or event responses or ticket sales, then mm -hmm. just try again. And are you doing it strictly through Facebook or are you doing uh, Google ads too? I do Google ads too, like on our YouTube videos, so push those. And Which are super cheap, by the way. Oh, yeah, dirt cheap, dirt, yeah. dirt cheap, absolutely. People are messing up if they are not taking advantage of stuff like that. Yeah. But between that and like Instagram, Facebook ads, mm -hmm. 
and then just like constantly pushing our Spotify too. Those are the best things you can be doing on the internet. I do find it surprising you don't have a website. So you're sending people to places where you can't monetize or track what they're doing necessarily. Why is that? Um, honestly, we just haven't gotten that far set up. It's on my to-do list, a website and getting the LLC. Um, I pretty much put our fan link and everything, which brings them to just a, like a right. splash page that I really just want people to listen to our music. I don't need them right. buying stuff all the time. I mean, that would be nice, but we just don't have a lot of merch at the moment. Oh, you don't? No. Okay. Like, we do have some t-shirts, but like not enough to fill an online store or anything. Right. And I just use that fan link and send people to listen to the music, to get them to shows, to buy it in person. What are the online streaming services like for you? Like, do you find that to be somewhat lucrative? Yes. I mean, there's money to be made there. Definitely. Like we use DistroKid. I think DistroKid's great. It's super user friendly and it gets your music everywhere really mm -hmm. quick. But I mean, I think it just comes down to playing shows and building a fan base and like making sure people are really listening to your music because if you're getting 20 streams a day, you're not making shit. But if you're getting 60,000 streams a day, then eventually that adds up way more than what Bandcamp's going to pay you. With the artwork and the shirts, like, do you guys have anyone who creates your logos or stuff? I know you get a lot. You had some pictures taken recently. Was that you? No, no, that was just a buddy of, of uh, ours. We kind of here and there just use me when it's convenient because it's kind of easy to set up on a tripod and just do it. But it's also a lot better to have somebody take your pictures so everything's in focus and everything's, you know, nice and crispy. And Do you have a logo or artwork or anybody that does that kind of stuff for you? As far as merch designs, I collaborate with my girlfriend a lot to just shoot ideas out. And then there's a local graphic design company that we've been working with called Rebel Squid. Great people over there. I know one of the designs Luke kind of came up with, but we sent everything over to Rebel Squid to kind of put on the mock shirts and touch up to make it look more professional looking. And then we go through a friend to print the shirts. But the artwork for CDs, we normally do like actual photos for artwork because I'm, I'm pretty big on that. I don't care for like the graphic design stuff. I'd rather have like a cool photo or something. And that we just have a bunch of photographer friends. So it's like, who do we feel like working with at that time? More of the show after this break. We all play a different part in the band. And that's something that really diversifies yourself when you're in a band is if everybody contributes in a different way aside from creating music. So it's like Nick is like the management portion of it with the promotion and the getting like good shows. And Ryan is the recording guy. He creates the music in the studio. And I'm like the media guy when it comes to like graphic design work here and there and photography and Alec, our guitar player, he writes most of the music. What about the videos you guys made? I know you got the purple one that you just released recently. <laughs> the purple one? That was a, a horrible experience. Why? Um, because we were in Ryan's basement, and instead of using just, like, fog and asking to turn it purple or something because yeah. it's 2019 or 18, and you definitely could do that, we thought it'd be smart to light off smoke bombs every time in Ryan's basement that didn't have great ventilation. So that's why... The and smoke bombs are meant to be inhaled. Oh, yeah, of course. That's why in the video, Alec and Ryan, they have masks on. And because it was fucking horrible to breathe in. And I am stubborn and was like, it won't look cool if I have a mask on. Right. So I just champed it out. And that was an awful experience. The floor was purple. After, like, I'd get, like, a minute into a take maybe. And I'm like, I cannot do this. And we'd have to go upstairs. And the floor, yeah, the floor was purple. The smoke, it smelled like gunpowder in his house for, like, two weeks probably. It was awful. Well, one smoke bomb filled up the entire house, actually. Really? So we let a test went off. And, you know, after it sort of seeps through the floor and, you know, the, the, the air system and whatnot, the whole house had purple smoke in it. But then we continued to light off at least like 15, 20 more. <laughs> so, so by the time we got to the end of it, we, I mean, we had to take breaks and, and you know, get out for air and just get away from it. Because, yeah, you, you, you can't breathe that. It's not good for your eyes. It's probably very toxic. It was, it was, a, it was a bad situation, but it turned out great. Yeah. I think it looks no, good. It looks good. It looks good. <laughs> So why do you guys play in a band? Somebody asked me the other day, like, why I still want to make music. And I'm like, I don't know, because it's what I do. I, I don't know. Like, if I didn't, it would be weird. 
I guess. So I, maybe you have a better answer. I just thought it was an interesting question that someone asked me. Yeah, I think that if I didn't, it would be weird is a good answer. Okay. Yeah. But honestly, I just like, it's like a lot of it's the travel part for me. I love traveling. But I mean, just growing up listening to music like My Chemical Romance and yeah. Under Oath and just like really looking up to them and just thinking it looked so badass to go to Warp Tour and see yeah. so many people rocking out. I just really like that. And it's cool that that can also pay your bills. Yeah. Last night we were standing in Nina and I was talking to Ryan and I was like, we got to drink free Miller Lite all night and we got a paycheck and we got to play a show. Like how does, how does nobody, like everybody should want to do this. Short Branch in Nina, Wisconsin. Okay. So up by Oshkosh. I mean, drumming's my favorite thing to do. So I mean, I'm trying to do that one way or another. But I mean, at the end of the day, playing in a band and continuing to do that whole grind, I guess it's just, Again, tagging along with his answer, but brings up cool, interesting life scenarios like, like this one. I don't like wouldn't have expected to be on a podcast, you know, right. a couple of weeks ago, but here we are talking to you, and it's just uh, a much cooler way to spend the day than maybe working, you know, a nine to five somewhere or, or anything else that I could be doing right now. I'd rather be out in Madison and. Yeah, we're going to check out some breweries after this and then play a show with some friends tonight. And it's just a, it's a good day, and it's definitely a cool thing to make it a job. Why do you do it? I do it for the nookie. <laughs> oh, my God. Did I really walk into that one? So I do it just because I just love playing music, whether I'm playing in a band or I'm making music at home, recording myself. Or over the last million years, you know, you, you just meet so many people that you – can count on to jam with that are very talented at their craft and you stick with those people and you find other people and sometimes those people don't work out and sometimes they do and I feel very content with where I'm at right now just with with us and with the, the other projects that I have and I gave up uh, playing music for a year last year to, jo to try and get into a trade and I and I and I hated it. I, I I got addicted to amphetamines for like a year because I was so stressed out, yeah. and that turned into you know me literally just turning my whole life around within the last year and f focusing on uh, media, focusing on playing uh, my technique, and you know I'm a lot happier than I was last year because I came back into music full circle again. Yeah. I just do it because I love it, and it's a. Uh, it's definitely a, a backbone for me. What was the trade that you were learning? Painting, industrial painting. Going to like shitty power plants, being like 200 feet up in the air, like oh, wow. spraying decks out, like just breathing in all this polyurethane and toxic really? bullshit. Just, it's just not worth it. You know, like, I mean, yeah, if you have kids and you, you know, you don't really know where your future's going, you're like, I'm going to get into a trade because that's what I did. But you know what? If you love what you do and even if you don't really make a lot of money, if you're happy, that's all that matters because yeah. at the end of the day, you get to go home with yourself and say, what did I do today? And you could be sitting in a cherry picker 200 feet in the air spraying down the side of a school or you could be playing music or getting into a hobby like photography or digital arts or something like that and try to make money off that. And yeah. the more you grind, the more, the farther you'll get in life with it. I don't think I've ever heard someone use this sentence you could be in a cherry picker spraying off the side of a school until now. I like that. That was <laughs> I never thought I'd hear those words combined. That's awesome. No, but that's really cool. I'm glad that you uh, were able to find that. That's awesome. We uh, will have a cover song that is coming out February 7th, so go stream that everywhere. And uh, we're, we're doing a cover of Heartless by The Weeknd, and it sounds sick, so I hope everyone enjoys it. And also mid-February, we're doing a split EP with our friends in Garden Home back in Milwaukee. So that'll be one original and one cover. And that cover is Somebody Kill Me by Adam Sandler from The Wedding Singer. Okay. It's, a, it's a classic. So yeah, new music will be out by the end of March. So definitely go check it out. You can learn more about American Bandit on their Bandcamp page at americanbandit.bandcamp.com. The music for this episode is by my band, Lorenzo's Music, from the song Just In Case. You can listen to that at lorenzosmusic.com. If you haven't already, don't forget to go to my website, tomraiswebsite.com, and subscribe to the podcast, or you can also listen to it on Spotify or wherever else you get your podcasts. I'll be back with one more episode next week, so until then, so long. So long.